hit me from places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. So, uh, tools for writing great software. So I'm going to start by what I'm not going to talk about. This is not about talk about uh, frameworks, no languages, no IDEs, no Kubernetes, no Ruby. Uh, give me some other stuff. No Scala. Um, what I'm going to talk about is actually the stuff that I collected over the years as being a uh, developer, architect, software engineer. Um, ways of looking at problems, ways of, ways of solving them, and specifically with a very, very uh, few facets of looking at stuff, of solving the right problems and solving the problems right. So these are all based on my experiences. And I urge you to look at them and um, make sure you take them with a grain of salt. It's all um, heuristics, okay? It's all s maybe maybe smart stuff that we did that we uh, people came up with. I didn't invent most of them, but it's not. Um, it's never rules. It's never dogma, okay? It's never you have to do this. You have to write statically typed code. Because dogma usually gets you into trouble. If you, if you look at statically typed code versus dynamically typed code, you can take a look at your problem and say, OK, in this case, statically typed code helps me. And in that one, it doesn't. So I've been around. I've been, uh, by, uh, well, by the way, I've started my career as a developer in the intelligence core as well. So uh, I spent my first six years as a software developer there. Um, and uh, I've been doing coding, architecting, designing, um, CTOs work. And lately, for the last year, I'm the chief architect of uh, Natural Intelligence, a very cool and uh, interesting web-related company. So let's start with the basics. You probably ho all heard of KISS, the keep it simple, stupid. And uh, we hear about it, we say, OK, let's keep things simple. But I can't um, emphasize how important it is. Keeping simple st things simple, by the way, keeping things simple, stupid, is points to two things. One of them is the it should be simple, stupid, stupid, simple. It's like very, very, very simple stuff. And the other one is, if you're not doing it, you're stupid. OK? So you can take a look at it from any uh, aspect you'd like. But really, the world is very, very, very noisy. We have clouds. We have uh, deployment problems. We have uh, microservices. We have re requirements from the field to move fast. And if we don't keep our stuff simple, we just wouldn't get there. And uh, again, when looking at, uh, at complexities, the first thing, thing you want to start from is making things as simple as possible to solve the problem. And then you can really build from there. So um, if you look uh, specifically about on uh, problems of uh, Oh, sorry, of solving a problem. If you take a look at your work, at, you know, as a programmer developer, usually when I ask people what they do at work, what is their job, I get the answer: we write code. Now I believe this is the wrong answer. Our job is not to write code. Our job is to solve problems, and our job is to solve problems for the business, and preferably to solve it once. So, we actually. If we don't have to do anything in order to solve the problem, that's even better. If we don't have to write a line of code, that's even better. So keeping it simple 
is actually sometimes asking, do I really need to do it? Okay, it's not, if, remember that every line of code that you add to the system, it's a line of code you need to debug, a line of code you need to maybe refactor later, and a, a line of code that has, adds complexity to the system. And other f any feature, any new feature adds complexity to the, s to the system by design. And complexity grows, and you know code bases grow. And again, if we start from looking at it from the keep it simple, stupid approach, we might uh, solve ourselves a lot of problems. So this is the single responsibility is like uh, kiss sun. Okay, how do I know if I'm keeping things simple? I'd look at my stuff. It could be on any level I'd like. It could be on the service level, system level, class level, method level. Is it doing one thing only? And uh, the fact that it's doing one thing only is good. It means it's simple. It means it's decoupled. It means going forward, I wouldn't have any uh, problems of uh, surprises with things that are doing things that are not uh, related. So if we take, for example, a service that needs to do two things. It needs to get a crowd a API responses for the API calls, and it might be, uh, might need some, to run some, uh, I don't know, patch process uh, to manipulate its data. So now when you look at this, it's, it happens sometimes when you have this kind of a service, and you say this is the same data, same database, let's do it together. But what happens is that when you look at the problem, you actually get to the point where the SLA of your system, the how fast, for instance, you need to answer the crude API, would suffer because I'm running the batch operation at the same time. Uh, so I'm using the same resources, it's also uh, going to interfere with the service. So sometimes it's better to decouple first, and then, and this is the price to pay when you decouple, uh, if I have an optimization problem, I can connect it. Now it's a million, and I'm like it's statistically checked, it's a million times uh, easier to couple things together than to decouple them. I would put my entire uh, history as a programmer on, the, on this uh, statement. Decouple it, and then if you have an optimization problem, couple it together. Okay. Asking why. I had uh, the privilege of uh, working when I first get out, uh, got out of the army uh, with a guy that was my team lead, and uh, probably you all had your experiences with uh, people that were role models for you when you uh, were uh, starting your careers. And I uh, actually thought I knew something because I was already programming for six years when I got out, uh, and then I got to work with this guy. And he had a very, very uh, special way of operating with me. I would come f to him with a very, very fancy solution to a problem. Some huge class hierarchy with a design, very, very s fancy stuff. And he would look at me, look at the solution, and say, why do you need this? And I kid you not, time after time that he would do that to me, I would look at my stuff and say, Oh, maybe I don't need that part, or maybe I don't need that, and sometimes it would be, okay, I don't need any of it. it. I could actually not write a line of code and still solve the problem. And um, since it worked so beautifully for him on me, I've utilized it ever since. So usually when people come to me and ask a question or show a solution, I would ask, why? And now, the, there's a technique called the 5Y technique that comes from the uh, Toyota manuf lean manufacturing uh, uh, idiom uh, that says you have to ask five times why, and every time on the answer for the question, ask a why. So, for instance, if I have a drop in my click-through rate on my uh, web pages, why do I have this uh, drop? I have more um, mobile traffic and it's slower. Why is it slower? It's slower because I'm downloading images with uh, wrong sizes for mobile or doing some JavaScript stuff. So the more I get into 
I, I jump over the sim symptoms and I go into the root cause, I get to the real reason that why things that happen. And, and this one is like straightforward, but there are sometimes very, very surprising uh, impacts of this technique. It's not perfect, but it's much better than not asking anything. And everybody that comes to you with a demand, let's do this, if you directly do that, you sometimes uh, lose the ideas behind the, uh, the request. So I would urge you specifically to ask your product managers why. By the way, any product managers in the room here? I, I thought so. Uh, so ask your product managers why. Sometimes they don't know. They would go to the business users and ask them, and then you would get the real reason and then you can actually do maybe some other stuff or some simpler stuff than the stuff they come up with. Uh, but it goes in on every level and on design level and coding and in refactoring on every level it's a very very powerful uh, tool. Yes? Okay. Okay, so another one, very good one, eating your own dog food. Now on the right, uh, you see a tablet containing Hammurabi's code. It's a code of laws that was generated, I think 3,700 years ago, so 1700 BC. Um, and one of the rules in this code sa states, and I'm quoting, I have it here, if a builder, it's a builder law, okay? The law of the builder. If a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, the house which he built fall and kills its owner, that builder shall be put to death, okay? If it kills the son of the owner, that's the rule number 230, then the builder's son should be put to death. If it kills a slave, then money. Um, so, I'm not uh, suggesting that uh, programmers that do shitty job would get killed, but it might be useful in some situations. Uh, but if you are the first user of your code, if you're writing infrastructure, if you're writing a service, if you're writing an API, you have to remember, the stuff you're writing is for your clients. And if you're eating your own dog food, you would be that client. Okay, you would have the problem of that client in, as part of writing your project. So if you do it as part of writing your project, that's great. Uh, you, can, you can do it as an integrated, sorry, sorry. You can do it as an integrated part of the, uh, of the uh, um, like integrating with another team at the end of the, pro of the process. But it's a very, very important one, and if you do that, I guarantee you, your APIs on, on library level and service level would be useful, would, would be built for, their all, for the right uh, purposes. Okay, so uh, in direction. Now, this is a power tool. Can you guys tell me what is the most powerful in direction? Let me define in direction first, okay? Not going directly to a thing, going through an intermediary. Okay, that's in direction. Not go directly. What is the most powerful indirection that we have in our lives? Not software. Any idea? Any ideas? Language is a powerful one. Yes, there's even more powerful one. Maybe I, I'm not sure. By the way, it might be strong enough. I'll help you. Money. Think about it. If there was no money, none of this civilization could happen, okay? We could not buy, well, we would do barter deals. We'd grow our own crops and eat them and maybe do some barter deals with our, you know, neighbors. Money is another level of indirection, okay? And it's, this is like for, for understanding how powerful this concept is. Now, when we go to computer science, and David Wheeler didn't just say it for his own fun that there's no problem in computer science that can't be solved in another level of indirection. That's because we have it everywhere. Pointers, uh, variable names, uh, design patterns, uh, um, V tables, um, classes, uh, everywhere we use indirections. But 
as with every power tool, everything comes with a, with a cost. And indirection could be adding us level of complexity. So it's a power tool, think about it uh, when you're looking at problems, but be careful how you use it. Okay, the main flow principle. Um, if you have a system that is running or a code that you're writing, you would like this code to do the things it needs to do in what I call a main flow, do one thing after the other, other and then finish, and then you know that your system is doing everything it needs to do all the time. Let me give you an example. If you have a backup and restore, the, get, the backup runs every day, really, really great, and then after six months you need to restore it. How many people have restore failed for them? Historically, okay, and there's some hands here. Uh, restore fails. Why? Because it's not part of the main flow. We actually have a system that needs to do backup and restore. That's the main flow, but you only do half of it. Okay, this is an example when you look at your system and you say, okay, I have a problem. My system doesn't start and finish. And you look at the, if you look at the code level, you can, you can actually see more subtle uh, 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 references, like if you're doing the same stuff in two parallel code bases, Okay, not good also. Also a deviation from the main flow. So a main flow is indication that something is wrong with the way your system is constructed or that you need to look at uh, the system and pay very, very good attention to what you're doing. So if you need to restore and you, you cannot do backup and then restore every day, you should probably do some very heavy checking around it. Okay. Mechanical sympathy. Now this is the one I really, really uh, like. I would like to tell you a story. Uh, this is a story from who called Sources of, of Power. And it's um, a story about a nurse in a maternity ward. Now this nurse is looking at the baby, a newborn. And this baby is fluctuating between a very, very healthy pink color and some other colors, like changing its color. Now, usually this is an indication that something is wrong, but it could happen. And then the baby turned deep black blue. Now, this is an indication of a serious problem. Immediately, the entire staff is called, a doctor, an x-ray technician, everybody's called to the room. And usually, in this case, what they do is they uh, think it's a collapsed lung. lung. This scenario of the baby becoming blue is usually a symptom of being uh, with a collapsed lung. So the nurse that looks at it is a little bit suspicious because she actually knows of a different uh, symptom, a different syndrome, sorry, that the problem is in the heart. And uh, it could look the same and, but the heart is the cause or root of the problem, and the last time it happened to her, the baby died before it was even being able to be diagnosed. So she looks at it, she suspects it's the heart and not the lung, and everybody get, get, is getting prepared to do the lung uh, uh, operation. She says to everybody, guys, I think it's the heart and everybody shows her the heart monitor. And it shows the baby's heart pounding at a steady, correct, healthy 130 beats per minute. So, but she doesn't cave. She says it's the heart and she takes a stethoscope and she checks, silences, silences everybody and checks the heart. And there's nothing, no heartbeat. She was right. And then the doctor comes in and the technician, the x-ray technician actually verifies that she's right. The heart is not beating. The doctor comes in and they save the kid's life. Now, this is a very inspiring story about, you know, non-conformity and, and, uh, and being, uh, being able to push through, uh, you know, uh, 
the social areas, the, the, the uh, impact of other people, and even, through, even in the face of facts, the heart monitoring w was showing that everything was fine. Later, when they checked why the heart monitor was showing the heart to beat correctly, they realized something. The heart monitor was checking the electrical pulses in the heart, not the actual beating. Now, because the heart was encased with uh, uh, um, air pressure that was pressing it, that was the syndrome, the heart was not beating, but the electrical signals that the, bra that the heart was generating was co were correct. So, and this is the point I want to connect to this mechanical sympathy thing. The fact that you know how a tool you're using is working allows you to understand where it can go wrong. And in this case, the intuition of the nurse, it's an intu intuitive, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing she doesn't know how the heart monitor works. But the intuition that she had that it might not be that, you know, fact uh, allowed her to actually save the baby's life. So usually in our line of work, we don't get to save uh, too many people, but it's correct for us as developers. If we know the tools we're using, if we know the database, the frameworks, the uh, cloud infrastructure, the, uh, whatever, the, whatever tool we're using, the languages, okay? If we know them better, we can generate better solutions. So, sorry. So the term itself was coined by uh, Jackie Stewart, who is uh, three times uh, Formula One champ champion, and he said something simple. He said, the best drivers understand how their cars work on the engine level, on the tires, on the suspension, on the wheels, they understand it. They, they can't build it, they're not the engineers, but they really understand it. And this allows them to be better drivers, the best drivers. And I'm, again, I'm saying that this is correct for us as developers. If we know the tools we're using, we're, we'll drive our application better. We'll do better work. So let me dive into that a little bit. Um, this table shows speeds of uh, accessing data from the CPU level down to the network level across continent. So the bluish, greenish area is the CPU accessing the data. You actually show, show, uh, seen a simple, uh, similar uh, table before. And my, by the way, my uh, my speed of accessing the main memory is faster than uh, <laughs> uh, this is a, a newer uh, CPU. It's actually based on specifications from 3.3 um, gigahertz latest model. Um, but it's interesting to see that it takes one nanosecond to uh, a register of the L1 cache, but it takes 60 times uh, more to access the main memory. Uh, you say, okay, 60 times, it's still nanoseconds, I don't care. But when you go to, uh, to the network, it's a thousand times slower. If you go to the disk, it's sometimes even slower. And if you go to a round trip in your data center, uh, this is like numbers checked. It's not real, you know, uh, it's not real statistics, but it's like simple checks. You have about a half a millisecond of packet sent and received overhead. And this is like so much more time than uh, doing it in, uh, in the CPU. So when you get to a uh, uh, disk, you, you actually go to a, around 10 millisecond, and when you go to cross-continent, it's nine, I, I checked for 9,000 uh, kilometers between US and Europe, or the West Coast and, uh, and, and Europe, it's around uh, 150 millisecond. Now, what's interesting about this is, besides the huge uh, scale differences, is that Physics really limits us, okay? Now this one, 150 se uh, fi uh, 50 milliseconds, can we go, go any faster? The answer yeah, is yes, but there is a limit. We can never go this 9,000 kilometers faster than 30 milliseconds. Speed of light takes 
30 milliseconds to pass through 9,000 kilometers. By the way, if you do the math, one kilometer is three, point, uh, three and a third microsecond for light, okay? So even uh, if you have your servers spread over one kilometer, you cannot talk to them faster than three, three and a third microsecond. You, second, you usually it's slower than that because we have buffers in between. But even if you stand with a mirror and you use uh, lights and you have dar uh, uh, direct line of sight, you can still not do it faster than 30 milliseconds if you're talking between US and Europe. Now, th there's a limit to what we do. And again, understanding those limits really helps us eventually write better stuff. So, there's another one which I hesitated to put in this uh, uh, talk, but uh, because this one about breaking the rules is very, very, very dangerous. It's, it's even more dangerous than indirection. But, but um, if you're using mechanical sympathy, you learn your tools, and if you ask a lot of whys, so you understand the premise of your problem, you can break the rules. And you can break the rules by the mere fact that you actually understand that for this specific problem, in this specific use case, the rules do not apply. So for instance, if you want to handle a lot of traffic, you know, eventually, uh, before the NoSQL, uh, let's call it uh, uh, concept burst into our uh, mind, everything was a relation database, everything needed to work with this kind of uh, methodology. And then came Google and Amazon and said, okay, guys, in our scale, it doesn't work. We have to break the rules. They're new rules, okay? They match the problem of big scale. They match the problem of big data, okay? So you can do it yourself. Just be very, very careful not to do it just for the fun of it and make sure that you make the mistakes and you will make mistakes when you're breaking the rules in small scale. Make the right mistakes, okay? If you're gonna do it on a major system, it's probably the wrong uh, thing to do. Don't do it there. Okay, so um, this is the list of stuff I mentioned. Um, I think the most important ones would be the mechanical sympathy and KISS, but if you take just any couple of those and try to look at the problem you're solving, uh, if you wanna solve the right problem or solve the problem right, take them into account when you look at your problems and I, gu I guarantee you would write great software. Thank you.